What story are you telling? Whether you're intentional about it or not, you have an audience and they think in story. The Doug Thompson podcast features diverse storytellers sharing their practical tips for telling the story they need others to envision and trust in order to take a new action. Here's your host, Doug Thompson. This episode of the Doug Thompson podcast was recorded from a live stream. The interview is here in its entirety. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're at. Uh, welcome to the the Doug Thompson podcast. I am here and joined by somebody I've known. How long have we known each other, Martin? It's a couple of years now, at yeah. least. Yeah, for at sure. At least, yeah. We've been through a little bit. Tracy D. Jornet was having a an 87 days to remake herself. I'm sort of like repeating day 86 because I'm not quite to the end of it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Martin joins us from uh, the other side of the pond, I guess we would like to say. Martin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm joining you from the, the UK. I'm just outside of uh, outside of London. I'm a communications coach. I've run my own business since 2002, helping people communicate with what I call greater impact. And uh, that was certainly one of the things that uh, Doug and I, we were first talking about when we met. Yeah, and you were very generous with your feedback. I remember when we, we sort of, in part one of the exercises in the class was, you know, just, just do a little video. And you gave us some some great feedback on the content, the way that I, I speak. Not that I consumed all of it. <laughs> well, it, it, to be fair, you know, when, when you're looking at it through a lens and you're, you're coaching people on impact on, on how they say things and all that, you know, I found that I, I had to sort of compart not necessarily compartment, but assimilate what you're telling me into something that I could do, something mm. that fit my style and what I was comfortable with. Is Can you, you find other people that aren't quite so difficult as me uh, to get them to be more impactful? <laughs> well, I think... Let's face facts. Human beings were we're very we're very habitual creatures. We find ways of doing things that work for us. The uh, uh, psychologists will call you they're called neurological shortcutting. That's what our brain does all the time. How can I automate as much of what I do as possible to leave my conscious mind free to concentrate on the challenges that are right here that are right now? Now that neurological shortcutting and habit forming is fantastic for doing that. But then we can kind of get stuck in terms of our habits and our ruts and the way that we do things. And the longer we've had those established patterns, then doing something outside of that presents more of a challenge to us. And that's when people feel, well, hang on a second. I've got this really good way of doing things. I know it works for me. If I step outside of that, am I taking a risk? Is there a, a risk of my performance dropping in the interim as I'm integrating a new skill? And that's a conversation that people have to have with themselves about, am I committed to getting better? And may I have to accept that I might take a slight dip in performance prior to then getting better? And there's loads of sporting examples of golfers, et cetera, who changed their grip and their performance dipped for a couple of months, but then they went back and they got a great deal better. So that resistance is natural because there's that concern about performance dipping. Will, will in the short term, will this have a negative impact? And of course, human beings were risk averse. We'll want to avoid something that we think will put us at risk. So it's not unusual. You just got to dangle that carrot about, well, what are you going to gain by this process? And then commit to it to shortcut that time where performance will dip and you'll see the upswing much quicker. No, it, you, you hit upon a lot of, you know, it's true. You, you have to sort of break things down. And, and as you mm. as you do that, it, you're rebuilding to sort of go, I, I use this in, from a technology perspective when you know, people are sort of adopting some new technology is that there's going to be a period of time where you're going to be less productive than what you are today, <laughs> but, yeah. but it will set you up for, you know, and ideally when you're doing a transformation, transformation is one of those big leaps that goes on. It's not, it's not a tweak. It is, hey, we need yeah. to change the way that we're doing things to go on and do whatever's next to set us up for us. Cause if you sort of stay in that, in that rut, in that routine, uh, eventually it starts again, doing you um, more harm than good. Yeah, for so, sure. And, and I think that's where, I mean, that, that's where in what, what I do, it's like, I know it's pointless saying to people, okay, you got this big pitch next week. Here's the 43 things you need to do differently. Because <laughs> <Yes, laughs> you know? yeah. that's just going to blow their mind. There's yeah. no way they're going to be able to do that. 
Now, I might say give people a range of things, but I'll say, here's the three things you need to go away and do. Do this one Monday and Tuesday. Do this one Wednesday and Thursday. Do this one Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, and build it up slowly, because there's, there's absolutely no point in hitting people with that that volume. So even when I'm coaching people, like if they say, well, I've got this big pitch next week, or I want you to review something that I've done, I have to resist my own temptation to want to help and give them everything and go, look, here's the top three things you need to go away and do differently. <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. And you were very kind with your feedback. And I think if you can focus on the things that have the biggest impact first, yeah, then you, you know, it also builds confidence as you sort of do those things and you can see that that working. So how did this all come about? I mean, you didn't start out as the impactologist by any means. So how, <laughs> no, I... what's the backstory and how did you get there? So sure, my, my backstory is that my first proper job out of university back on when I started August the 15th, 1991, was as a business to consumer salesperson, as a travel agent, you know, with, back in the days before the internet, where the only ways you could book a flight was to ring a travel, was to ring a, an airline or to go to a travel agent. So I was a travel agent. And within 18 months of joining that company, I won the sales consultant of the year award in 1993. And I, I always say to people, that's the last time I won anything on pure raw talent. <laughs> From that point forward, it was like, okay, I've reached a particular point. Now, how do I get better? Now, the only reason I'd, I'd achieved that was that I noticed that I did have a habit of paying attention to what other people did. Now, how, how was that person successful? And if that person is doing something and they're continually getting better results, what is it that I can do that I can copy, I can model, you know, uh, Pablo Picasso, the famous artist, said, a, a good artist copy, great artists steal. So I was always looking for tools and techniques that I could steal. If I could see that it would work, I'd have that. So I always had that curiosity about, you know, how do you get better? And it was initially from a, a sales background. And then I moved into leadership positions and people would, I'd hire people and people would say, how do I get better? And I go, well, okay, well, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? I find that this works. And then I moved more into formal training when I set up my own consultancy in 2002. And then I was, I was working a lot with a lot of other training companies. I think on last count, I've represented 17 different training companies as a freelancer. And what each of those training companies would do is they would say, okay, we want you to run this course on presentation skills. And we, here's all the models that we use. Here's all the things that we know. Uh, do you know this model? Yes. Have you heard of this psychologist? Yes. Did you know about this? Ooh, no. And they go, well, you're going to have to teach it. So we need to teach you it. So I, I just like a super sponge. I just soaked up all this information around all the different areas and then got introduced. I was actually working at one of the top business schools in the world, London Business School. And they had this particular company had a program they called Personal Impact. And the training that I went through for that was really built on some of my innate curiosity about how do we do that, but broke it down to body language, voice, rhetorical techniques on how to use language. And undermining all of that was my own psychological interest and confidence and how to handle performance pressure. So, I mean, you know, when you get up on that TEDx stage, it's a little bit different than three or four of your colleagues in a, in a meeting room. You know, what you're, the words that you're going to say are the same, but that feeling from having a big audience you know, if you don't have the confidence to be able to get out there and do your thing and present yourself, you know, that can undermine everything else. So then that, that real focus became clear for me and all of the things that I was interested in kind of all came together. And it was all about that impact. And I was how I then came to impactologist. I met an old school friend of mine. This is back in 2014, I think, out in Dubai. I was working in Dubai. He lived there. And he runs a, a company uh, not doing some dissimilar stuff to me. But he said to me, oh, I've invented a new job title for myself. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, I'm a presentologist. I help people present better. And I had two thoughts simultaneously. The first one was a rude word saying, well, that's just very stupid and silly. And then the second one was, well, hang on, actually, that's actually quite clever. Because what I want to do now is I'll go, well, well what's that about? And then we continued having a, a, a few beer, cool beers and catching up. And on my walk back to the hotel, uh, I just thought, well, if he's going to call himself a presentologist, what am I going to call myself? And that word just impactologist, uh, alcohol fuel just popped into my head and the rest is history. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's, that's, you know, I, I like that. And 
I like Picasso's things about stealing things because a lot of the yeah. the stories that I tell, I, I've stolen from other people, and mm. you know, it, but it, it, but it's not necessarily the exact same story. But it's like I look for a story in my life that is very much like that, or something. You know, what can I relate to that as I go on? But and in the TEDx thing, you know, I've spoken in front of a thousand people before, and it didn't bother me before. But I go to that TEDx thing, and because <laughs> there were certain rules. Yeah, some, some of it was for blocking for camera. You had to stay in this circle and the red uh, circle. The red, yeah, and, and it was like, okay, I felt like a caged tire. I, I felt <clears throat> so much constraints. You know, I, I focus more on the constraints than I did the opportunity to go on. So if I do it again. I'm going to do a little bit differently ab about that. But but you mentioned the earlier on. You talked about sort of the shortcuts that our brains do. And that was part of it was in my TED talk. I talked about these things because you really have to have the conscious mind. Only about 10 percent of our mind available is, is for conscious things we have to act on. And sure. so that's why we just sort of again, we get in these habits and on as I was. So now you went you, you talked about the body language is, is one of the first three things that you that you focused on becoming the impactologist. And now you've got behind it. You've got some cards here. You sent me you got something coming up. Was it today? Body language, um, body language that decoder. Yeah, body, lang body language decoder. Yeah, so it's being published in the UK on the 14th of October and in the US on the 9th of November, but it is available for pre order on Amazon. I, you know, so I went through it. I, I was fortunate enough that Martin gave me some of these things to, to look at and all. And as I'm going through them, I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one, one of the art artists was, was, was good that you hired because if I would have done this, it would have been crooked stick figures. <laughs> um, but I was looking through some of these things and I'll talk about so the, the hand pat. And I was yeah. going through, and, and how do you do that with fist bumps now? So I, a lot of the, the couple of questions are going to come now is how has COVID and how sort of this pandemic changed some of the stuff that's in there? Because some of these things, people are hesitant to do it or for whatever reason. How do you overcome that or how do you decipher like that? And then also a lot of the facial expressions with, with a mask on. How do hmm. you compensate for that? Yeah, well, so there's two things here around body language. There's expressive body language. How do we use our body language to be more effective as communicators? And then the second part is then getting a better sense of how are people thinking or feeling or responding to when we're communicating our message. So there's that outward and, and inward. So there's two there's a two way street on that. And I think COVID and the pandemic has shifted a lot of our behaviors. But underneath that, so there's still some basic truth. We want to get our message across as well as possible, and we want to be able to read people as as well as possible. And how how is our message landed? Now we've had to kind of navigate now how we how we actually do that with some of the constraints. But evolution is one of human beings' great strengths. You know, we we can we can evolve. And I think you know, with the for, sorry, for example, the hand pat there. That's in there as one of the power plays. Uh, that's in the power play section. Is this is where this is something you can see people doing. They're looking to assert themselves. You know, they're patting somebody on the hand. Uh, President Trump very famously with the Japanese Prime Minister when he uh, when he came to visit. You know, held on to his hand and was patting his hand. And you could see the Japanese Prime Minister's response to that when he was doing it. You know, it's President Trump here. You're in you know, you're in the White House. You're in my house. It's my patch. I'm in charge. So that's one of the one of the power plays that we talk about. So how do you use your body language to be to to connect with people? And that's interesting, you know, the kind of the the elbow bump or things like this. Now, what's underneath that is a genuine desire to connect, a genuine desire to show people that you know we we're happy to see them, we we like being with them, we're appreciating what they're saying. So we got to flex. We got to go. How else can I show that? And perhaps we look, we use our facial expressions more that we can't use touch so much. You know, on on Zoom calls or on, on video conferencing now, it's interesting. You know, the whole Zoom fatigue thing, and where does that come from? And there's definitely some more and more research coming out all the time that certainly as speakers, because we can't see the reaction from people, we're less likely to gesticulate. We're less likely to use our facial expressions, which makes it more boring for the audience. So they're more likely to disconnect. So there's like this whole circle of things that we need to be aware of and go, okay, so in my new environment, how do I alter my behavior? The things that I used to do perhaps wouldn't work. What can I do differently? And that's why it's great to have a range of tools 
to be to be able to use. So for me, it's it's about what it's always been about success. It's about adaptability, as Darwin said. It's not the strongest of species that survive. It's the ones that are most adaptable to change. No, uh, that's that's a great point. <clears throat> I got to do a, an in person uh, talk the other day at at a conference. And, and I was talking with with one of my uh, connection, Lila Smith, about this the other. We were sort of having a, a, not a debate, but you can be effective and you know through Zoom or what have you. Uh, some people can be more effective, and I think some of it is a personality. But there's there's an unseen energy and vibe, for lack of a better term, that I get when I'm talking to people live. Like you said, I, I think because yeah. even here with a camera on, even if I'm looking at the camera. This sort of brings up the whole other thing. If I got multiple monitors, I may be looking like right now. I'm looking at you as opposed to the camera, and it it, it sort of you know sort of destroys the the interaction with that. So I have to get used to looking into the camera and then and sort of you at the offside. But yeah. there's <clears throat> it being live, totally different vibe and energy that I got than even my best day on on Zoom or what have you. Is hmm. it, it, do you do you find the same thing? Well, interestingly enough, I still haven't done any a live event uh, since since the pandemic. <laughs> so everything I haven't had that contrast yet, and um, I think it may well be well into next month. Actually, in fact, before that even uh, is a possibility. But again, I come back to I come back to that point about how do you make that environment uh, work, and how do you look for that interaction? So when when we're doing our our virtual uh, communication. What are the ways we can get that connection? So like involving people much more, being much more demonstrative in your in your body language and your gestures and creating opportunities for people to communicate back with you. In a room full of people, you can say, so I'm sure that it all makes sense. And you can scan the room and you can see 30 people. Oh, yeah. Now you can't do that on a computer screen. Even if you've got 30 little boxes, there's no way you're gonna be able to, to do all of the all of the 30 boxes. So we need we need to adapt. We need to find ways of doing things and, and how to be able to to get that. You can't you can't get the same vibe, but you got to look to repl what are the options for replacing those building blocks. I think mm -hmm. is probably the best way to put it. Yeah, no, I, I I would agree with that. And there's engagement. There's different things that I've done to do. But if I had to do sort of a ranking, there's nothing that beats that in person piece yeah. in the energy uh, uh, yeah, you get. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, agreed. So I, I want to go back to. You know, you talk about giving 47 tips or what have you and all that, but even even one or two, as I look at the tips or things to do, how can I concentrate on my gestures when I sort of, you know, I have to focus on what I'm saying because, you know, sometimes my mouth is in gear and the brain's, you know, way behind it. It's in neutral somewhere. So how do I, how do I get these things in sync? What's the best tip for that? So the best tip for that is, is first of all, decide. You know, the, the brain wants clarity. It's like, you know, shall I or shan't I? Or, or even using words like, uh, I'll try and do this. And your brain goes, really? I mean, pff, that's, that's, you know, it's not, you talk about, you, you know, 90% of your behavior being driven by your, your unconscious. And your unconscious hears, well, try and do that. It goes, that, I'm too busy. I got all stuff to do. So it's, it's, first of all, is you got to make a decision. And then you got to focus. And you got to think about motivation. Well, what's, what's in it for me? And I always use the example of uh, years gone by, I used to do a lot of work actually in, in the States and I worked did a lot of work in the pharmaceutical industry. So I was never in city centers, I was always outside somewhere. So I was hiring a car to drive. So I had to drive on the other side of the road. And I'd spent 30 years driving on, on the left. Now all of a sudden a little bit of jet lag, I'm having to drive on the right. Now imagine what might've happened if I thought, well, I'll try it, I'll give it a go. Let's, uh, yeah. Maybe, you know, no, failure is yeah. not an option in that yeah. scenario. You have to decide and you say, right, I'm doing it. And then you, once you've decided that your brain goes, oh, we're doing this thing now, um, how? And it starts looking for those tools and techniques. It's the same as, you know, President Kennedy said, you know, famously get up and said, you know, within this decade, we'll put a man on the moon. And, you know, everybody from NASA said, what did you just say? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, right, I'm taking the decision for you. So now we have to close the gap between where we are and where we want to be. So decide, I'm going to do this. Motivation. You mentioned that, you know, thinking about what are the upsides? 
of me doing this? What are the upsides of me doing this? And the third then is just do it, it's practice it. And so many people have said to me over the years, oh, I'll do that in my meeting next week. And I'm going, no, 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 no. Doing it in the meeting next week with your boss is not time to be doing it for the first <laughs> time. That wants to be the 153rd time you do it in the meeting next week. Yeah. So like any skill, you just got to build it up. You got to try it in the first time you do it. I mean, of course, driving out of the airport for the first time on the wrong side of the road, you know, my brain's screaming, you're yeah. going you die you're on the <laughs> wrong side of the road we yeah. have to override that and go yeah. no i'm on the i'm on literally the right side of the road for the environment that i'm now operating i get behind this decision and give me the tools and the techniques to make this happen well at least you got in one where the the steering wheel was on the opposite side of what you're used to we went to the cayman islands uh, a couple years back for for vacation and they were driving on what I would call on your side of the road. They were driving, but it was an American car, so the steering wheel was still on the yeah, same side. That's... I was, I, you know, I was like, "Wow, this is some really bad overload." And what was scared me more was when I got back into town. <laughs> I yeah. start? Well, yeah, that wouldn't be bad. So luckily, I wasn't tired to do that. You use politicians a lot as examples. Mm. Why is that? Uh, just because they're available all the time. They're 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 just there. I mean. They're on the, our, our TV screens most evenings. Most evenings, they'll be a news story, either domestic or international. And we'll, you know, we, we'll have to look at them and we have to listen to them. And I think because uh, th so that, that's one reason. The second reason is most of them are schooled in this stuff. Most of them are taught this. You know, they have on tap body language coaches, on tap, uh, you know, voice coaches. They're speeches are famously written for them drafted redrafted to make sure all those rhetorical techniques so they tend to be uh, i use that word deliberately they tend to be good examples of how to do it and sometimes how not to do it and you uh, so it's great when people you know say to me well well I don't think I've ever seen that. And then go, right, watch this speech with Joe Biden. Watch the speech with Ronald Reagan. And you'll see this being done. Look at what Greta Thunberg has just said. Look at what Jacinta Ardern, the prime minister of New Zealand, has just done. You actually see these tools and techniques. So I point people towards politicians because very often they've seen them speak, but never necessarily seen the techniques. Mm -hmm. And then they go back and they go, Oh, 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 they are, aren't they? You know, well, that's interesting. Yeah. And what's even more interesting is when you see them mess up or when you see them do things that perhaps they shouldn't be doing. So, for example, uh, the, during uh, President Trump's second impeachment trial, one of the, Dem one of the uh, Democrat prosecutors, uh, Representative Joe Neguse, was, was, was doing his presentation. As he looked at the Democrat side, he was getting some support. But obviously, we looked at the Senate, you know, we looked at the other side of the Senate, the Republicans, he's getting a good bit of different energy. And he did what we call the ring reassurance. He was, yeah, he that. started playing with his wedding ring. And in one, I, I measured it, he, he touched his wedding ring 14 times in one 60 second mm. portion. So you, his nervousness, his, his feeling of, you know, that you talk about the vibe, <laughs> you know, he was getting a vibe from one side yeah. of the house. And there it was evident in his behaviors. You could actually see it even from somebody who was by and large doing a really good job of communicating confidently. And for me, that's always interesting. Even when people are schooled and they're good at it, there'll be some signals, but are you paying attention? Can you see the signals? And also be aware of the signals that we might be giving out under pressure. So politicians are really good for that because they're on stage, they're available, and we can see them doing what they're supposed to do and sometimes what they're not supposed to do. Yeah, as, you, as I read the cards you know, with the wedding ring, you, you talked about that. I, I, I can remember back times... When I mindlessly, whatever, you know, I didn't think about what I was doing it. I'm, and I, but I, unfortunately, I can't remember what I was feeling at the time, but apparently it probably wasn't. I, 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 I don't look at politicians. This is just a personal preference for me. I don't look at politicians and, or actors because they're all paid to lie or be deceitful mm. or, or, be, <laughs> or be something, right? I mean, not necessarily. Yeah. I, that's a harsh generalization, but they're, they're designed to be this thing, right? And I like watching comedians doing mm. things in the delivery. And one, one, I am more attracted to humor than I am um, big oratory type things. But they, I, I like the timing that they have, and I like 
the way mm. that they tell the stories between you know because they have sort of have to build up and explain what's what's funny but that's just a personal preference and you know you, again you could point them to youtube and, and do i i use examples of that but but either way yeah. it's good if you can visually see somebody and it also ruins a movie so if, if you sort of like <laughs> I, I ruined a lot of movies for my wife and you know, especially with technology oh you can't do that yeah you know, so I, I was <laughs> <clears throat> You'll see. You have this one thing. So this was the one, and for my audience on the podcast, you can go check this out on the YouTube video. We'll have it there too. But it's the moving of the hands. Mm. I this is probably the thing I struggle with them, especially when I've got my mic here because I've been known to hit my mic because I I use gestures a lot with my hands and when I'm presenting yeah. and stuff on that. And uh, I always said if you tied my hands, I couldn't talk because there's always something moving. Is there is there a danger of doing too much to distract mm. you from the minute? Because now, now, now you're going to ruin me, and I'm going to be thinking about that the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, so, so there's two things here. First of all, animating, using the hands more, particularly if you're speaking to people who are not hearing their first language, is incredibly useful. What are generally called illustrative gestures. So if you say, you know, you know, so here's where we are today, the next stage, the next stage, the next stage. You can see, see the, the progressions. And certainly if it's a second language, you say, you know, it's a small change to make, but there's a big gain that we can get. So those gestures that really reinforce the meaning. And because of the brain receiving information uh, verbally, what we can hear, but also visually, we call that multisensory communication. So if you say it's small, but you say it's small, and they say it's small, then all three of those things are all pointing to the same meaning, right? Now, if you just say it's small, you know, the word's there, but I'm not getting the visual or the sound meaning. So being able to reinforce things visually increases the level of comprehension and meaning, and inevitably motivation for people then to go off and do things. The downside is that when the hands don't really seem to match what's happening, now they're kind of distracting. Uh, I'm sorry to use another example, but President Trump was well known for his accordion hands. He would do this all the time. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, well, what does that mean? You know, it doesn't fit in with anything. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're gesticulating, but it's not adding to. Right. And in fact, it may actually now be di distracting because now I'm thinking about, well, what's that all about? And I'm not, and I'm, as I'm doing that because it's not in line with the spoken message, mm -hmm. there's now a disconnect with that meaning. The meaning, my comprehension of meaning is dropping because the visual cues I'm getting and the oral cues don't align anymore. So the thing with hands then is to think about bring them into play to show that demonstrate extra meaning. And the cards there have got a number of ways you can show that actual meaning. Some people do need to think about, are they now distracting? And the best way of doing that is to watch video of themselves. You know, set up a, a smartphone, and I know it's painful, none of us like it, but just get a sense of what your audience experience is like. What is it like being on the receiving end of you? And they can start to think about how you might want to edit things based on that. Yeah, and there's also the danger of the disconnect of do you or do you perceive as not telling the truth when your hand gestures, your body gestures don't match what you're saying. Yeah, so there's what we call truth slips. So this is where your your body says something else other than what your what your words are saying. So the very famous example of uh, of Richard Nixon going, "I'm not a crook." I earned every cent of that money, you know. So he, he nodded his head, yes, yeah. when he said, "I'm not a crook," and and shook his head, "I earned every cent of that money." When he when he when he so like there there you've got a disconnect, but also deception experts will tell you that when people are attempting to deceive, they tend not to move. They tend to be very still. They tend to freeze their upper bodies and not move at all. So it actually can link into deception because it's it's a big cognitive overload to knowingly deceive and then try to think now, now how do I genuinely get my <laughs> yeah, hands to exactly. back up this message that I don't that I know is is false so that cognitive overload tends to result in people just not using their hands whatsoever so if you're communicating with somebody and they move their hands a lot then they get to something and you're not so sure about whether they're telling the truth at, at that point their gesticulation level just plummets that's mm -hmm. like, well, hang on a second. Yeah. What's going on here? There, yeah. There's a difference here. There's a contrast. That's that's amazing stuff. And, and now, you know, is 
So you you also shared with me you've got some videos coming too that sort of illustrate some of these things. Uh, is yes. for a class or something you got coming up, and the one that you shared with me that you done was brilliant, and you you did the comparison, which is very helpful. So uh, is that coming out as is a, a course or uh, some something? Yeah. Yeah, so I've got an online course coming out in teachable.com called Body Language Communication Mastery. And that's going to be 101 videos demonstrating all of these different uh, tools and techniques. So everything, there's 46 different hand gestures you can make. Uh, those are broken down into confidence gestures, meaning gestures, suggested action gestures, and supporting gestures. So things that do support how to use your face, your head, your overall posture and a whole bunch of things not to do with your body language. So that's coming out, should be in a couple, another two to three weeks coming out, uh, body language communication mastery, and that's gonna be available on teachable.com, yeah. But uh, cool, I, I really, and don't, you, if you're using me for an example, I'm sure it's probably gonna be on the what not to do, because <laughs> I, I <laughs> it's been going on. Well, Martin, it's been a blast talking with you. Every time I talk with you, I learn something new. Um, how can best pe people get best hold of you? And I'll put all these things in the show notes and links as well. Yeah, so the platform I'm most active on is LinkedIn. So I publish some um, free tools and some free tips on there. There's a, if you scroll back, there's a number of different videos and analysis and stuff on there. You can find me on Twitter on at impactologist, two T's in the middle. And I'm on uh, Instagram as well, Martin Brooks 1968. So people can find me there. But LinkedIn is the best platform and there's some free videos and tools and tips up on there as well well cool and martin go out and if you want to be more impactful i i've not found anybody that gave bet me better tips and information than martin has so martin thanks a lot and until next time bye